Here is President Bill Clinton at a 1995 press conference. Today I'm announcing broad executive action to protect the young people of the United States from the awful dangers of tobacco. By executive authority, I will restrict sharply the advertising, promotion, distribution, and marketing of cigarettes to teenagers. The executive authority he invoked was, in fact, assigned by statute to the Secretary of the Department of Health and Human Services. One commentator described President Clinton as stepping out of the traditional role of president as overseer into the very different role of decider. As then law professor Elena Kagan wrote, presidential control of administration expanded significantly during the Clinton presidency. President Clinton treated the sphere of regulation as his own and in doing so made it his own in a way no other modern president had done. Whether the subject was health care, welfare reform, tobacco, or guns, a self-conscious and central object of the White House was to devise, direct, and or finally announce administrative actions, regulations, guidance, enforcement strategies, and reports to showcase and advance presidential policies. In executing this strategy, the White House in large measure measure set the administrative agenda for key agencies, heavily influencing what they would or would not spend time on and what they would or would not generate as regulatory product. As we shall see when we read the Brown and Williamson case, the U.S. Supreme Court would later frustrate the president by holding that the agency lacked the authority to regulate tobacco. But what gave president, the president directive authority over the agency in the first place? It could be explained as flowing from EO 12866, which had replaced President Reagan's EO 12291. But that simply moves the bump to another part of the rug. Professor Kagan wrote, Reagan disclaimed authority to displace the judgment of agency officials. The Clinton order, by contrast, implied precisely this power, presidential directive authority over discretionary decisions assigned by Congress to other specified executive branch officials. The president would not need to resort to his power of removal over executive branch heads to ensure a certain rulemaking result. That result would, or at least should, follow by virtue of a presidential, displacing a secretarial, order. This might not seem like such a big deal, but it is. Consider. A typical agency official wants to do his job and to do it well. He does not merely want to avoid getting fired or disciplined. He wants to do his job. But what is his job? Is it his duty to use his best judgment? Congress has delegated broad decision-making authority, and he has ideas about what the best decision is, but the president directs otherwise. Should he still do what he thinks best? Or only to do as he's told? Is it his job now to carry out orders from the president? Just because the president says it is his job? This issue affects the whole culture of an agency. Like all workplaces, agencies are both cooperative and competitive environments. Working together with people means agreeing about what the task is. Are we to do what we think is best? I'm going to do as I'm told. And those who do better in figuring out what the task is and in doing it are likely to get the good performance reviews, rewards, promotions, plum assignments, and so forth. Now to the present. President Trump is pictured here with his former policy advisor, Steve Bannon, like Rubin, also late of the investment bank, Goldman Sachs. Consider this executive order. Purpose. It is the policy of the executive branch to be prudent and financially responsible in the expenditure of funds from both public and private sources. 
unless prohibited by law, whenever an executive department or agency publicly proposes a new regulation, it shall identify at least two existing regulations to be repealed. The total incremental cost of all new regulations, including repealed regulations, to be finalized this year shall be no greater than zero unless otherwise required by law. Assuming could be subjected to judicial review, would this order survive scrutiny under Youngstown Steel? Professor, now Justice Kagan, formulated the challenge for the courts. If Congress, as it usually does, simply has assigned discretionary authority to an agency official without in any way commenting on the president's role in the delegation, then an interpretive question arises. She proposed an interpretive principle to guide courts in answering. An interpretive principle presuming an undifferentiated presidential control of executive agency officials may reflect more accurately than any other the general intent and understanding of Congress. The weight of the scholarly case for presuming such a sweeping intention to Congress is considerably greater now that Professor Kagan is Justice Kagan. Hers is an intermediate position between the conventional view, which affirms Humphrey's executor and a wide reading of Kendall that presumes the absence of directive authority in the president. And the unitary executive view, which would overrule Humphrey's executor and read Kendall narrowly, conclusively giving the president directive authority over officers. In her view, the presidential administration theory Humphrey's executor survives, but a narrow reading of Kendall is adopted, giving the president directive authority absent clear congressional statement to the contrary. The presumption is rebutted, she wrote, with respect to the independent administrative agencies. In other words, by providing the heads of the independent agencies with protection against dismissal by the president for mere policy differences, Congress signaled its intention to deny directive authority to the president. Conversely, would Congress's failure to provide for cause protections to an officer sustain the presumption that the officer be subject to presidential directive authority? Consider the implications of this. The Attorney General has expressly defended the independence of the Department of Justice. But the Attorney General serves, and presumably can only serve, at the President's pleasure. Should Congress's failure to take the constitutionally inadmissible step of giving the Attorney General for cause protection from dismissal be construed as signifying Congress's acquiescence in the President's possible assertion of directive authority over the Justice Department? Serving at the pleasure of the president does not logically entail having a duty to submit to the president's directive authority. An attorney general may coherently say, you may fire me if you don't like the job I'm doing, but you have no right to tell me how to do it. And so also with any executive official acting under a broad delegation of decision-making authority from Congress. And if any official may coherently say it, what reason can there be for presuming that Congress did not intend to let it be said? Perhaps Justice Kagan, if not Professor Kagan, would agree. There is no evidence that anyone ever offered a crown to George Washington, but no one offered him directive authority either. <laughs> 